Redeeming capitalism is important because capitalism is important. We can talk about alternative economic systems all day long if we like, but the fact of the matter is we live in a capitalist culture, a capitalist society, and we are part of a global capitalist community. So we need to understand what capitalism is, how it works, whether it's working well, and really look at the good, the bad, and the ugly of this thing we call capitalism and decide whether or not we want to change it in any way, whether it's changeable, whether we think it's a force for good or evil. And these are really important questions because they don't just affect our pocketbooks. They affect what kind of culture we're going to live in, what kind of society we're going to have. At the end of the day, people seem to forget that economics hasn't always been a mathematical modeling science. For most of human history, economics was a social science, even a moral science. And that's because every economic decision every person makes is a moral choice. So we really need to have a better grasp of what capitalism is, and that's what this book does. Let me start by the title of the book. It's called Redeeming Capitalism, Not Replacing Capitalism. And right now there's a serious debate in this country about whether or not capitalism serves the common good. And it's a reasonable debate. So in this book, I unpack what capitalism is and I ask how we can redeem it so that it does serve the common good. The key question that this book answers is capitalism is a subject not an object. In other words, it doesn't possess any personality traits of its own. It doesn't have an endemic moral compass. It simply reflects the ethics or the morality of the country or the culture in which it resides. So if that's true, we can make capitalism anything we want. We can mold it, we can change it, we can help it evolve. And in the book, I actually point out four different capitalist epics from the traditional capitalism that Adam Smith observed, to that which Max Weber observed, to what I call postmodern capitalism, the capitalism we have today, and challenge readers to envision a new form of capitalism that's more virtuous. If nothing else, this book reminds everyone about the social and moral roots of capitalism. We have just bought into hook, line, and sinker the rather pernicious belief that ethical egoism is what drives capitalism. And that's simply wrong historically. Adam Smith is probably the most misunderstood person in human history and is often quoted out of context to defend this kind of Friedman doctrine of the only moral responsibility of a director is to make as much money as possible within the constraints of law and custom. Well, that's a lousy doctrine for a lot of reasons and I unpack that in the book. The fact of the matter is the purpose of economics, the purpose of capitalism, or any economic system is human flourishing. What I hope people get from this book is a belief in the possibility that we can change the narrative. I say right at the end of the book that this book is not a manifesto for a movement. It's a credo for a community of believers who are convinced that we can simply do better in our economic system in a way that glorifies God, in a way that improves our culture, in a way that helps people come out of poverty, and in a way that is simply more fair than it is today. A lot of people are nervous about capitalism. Only 19% of millennials, according to a new Harvard survey, even identify as capitalists. Well, if we don't redeem capitalism, I can promise you we're not going to like what replaces it. What I want people to understand is, while this book is written by a theologian, and clearly has theological overtones. The task before us has nothing to do with religion per se, but it does have a lot to do with faith. You can't possibly have a healthy working economy without faith. If I were to reach into my pocket right now and take out a $10 bill, the objective reality is that this is a piece of paper, nothing more. But we have faith in the Federal Reserve System we have faith in fiat money. We have faith in the government that backs it. That allows us to take a piece of paper and exchange it for real live goods and services. So what I want people to understand is that they need to regain faith 
in things bigger than themselves, which for a believer starts with God, but even for a non-believer, we need faith in things bigger than ourselves and we need hope for the future. And as I say in the book, all of the virtues are ultimately built on love. And love is missing from the economy today. And everybody, regardless of their religious position, political position, can understand the value and the necessity of love in all human intercourse, including economics. I'm not a career academic. I spent most of my life doing international business at a pretty high level all over the world. I wasn't surprised by the financial crisis of 2008 because while I have seen the positive effects of capitalism to create wealth and lift people out of poverty, I also saw the dark side of capitalism in the boardroom on many occasions. So this book in some ways was born out of the financial crisis of 2008. And I unpack it in the first chapter of the book in considerable detail. And I describe a lack of faith. In fact, I describe a kind of cynical capitalism that failed to take into consideration anyone's concerns other than the concerns of the people who made the disastrous decisions that led to the crisis. That doesn't have to happen. We can again change the narrative so that people understand that Every economic decision is a moral choice and it affects other people. There's no such thing as a solo economic choice. It affects you, it affects me, it affects the environment. And that's why we need to bring faith, hope and love back into economics and especially capitalism because it has no moral compass of its own. What I want people to understand is there are no quick fixes. I spend a lot of time in the book giving a fair assessment, I think, of various utopian alternatives to capitalism. And they all fail for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is the breadth and the complexity of our global economic system. But that doesn't mean we can't change it. We have to understand that it's a long-term process. There are no quick fixes. It's an evolution, but it starts with individuals making the decision to do different things to change the way we think and the way we act in all of our economics. That we can do from the bottom up and the top down. Now most people don't have the luxury of being top down influences, but we all have the ability to be bottom up influences. And that's what I want people to take away from the book.